brothers and sisters welcome to another edition of the remnant report i am your host the remnant warrior and today my guest all the way from south africa is brother tertius Fori. but before brother tertius and i dive in the discussion we've got planned for you all we are going to play a news clip from the full-scale war that could very easily turn into World War III that began in the Middle East in the nation of Israel this morning where over 5,000 rockets were launched into Israel in the first hour of the attack on the nation of Israel in the Middle East. And it is because of the topic of today's episode being about Bible prophecy, end times Bible prophecy, and to be specific that I decided to play this news clip at the very beginning of the program to show you guys exactly the kind of things that he and I mean when we talk about Bible prophecy and just how dire and how close we are to the return of Jesus Christ and even closer to the revealing of the man of sin and it is something that Christians and non-Christians alike need to wake up and realize before it's too late. Brothers and sisters, without any further ado, here is the news clip from the war in Israel that is taking place as we speak. Militants from Hamas launched a surprise attack from the Gaza Strip. Israel's National Rescue Service said at least 100 people have been killed and hundreds more are wounded, making it the deadliest attack in Israel in years. Shortly afterwards, the Palestinian militant group Hamas claimed responsibility for the attack, calling for a general uprising against Israel. International correspondent Flavia Capellini has more on the series of attacks from Jerusalem. We are experiencing very tense times now in Israel. Since 6.30 in the morning, there were a launch of rockets from Gaza. Uh, immediately, Hamas claimed responsibility and called this operation Al-Aqsa Flood. Uh, thousands of rockets, as we said, have been launched from Gaza against Israel, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, south of Tel Aviv. But most significantly, a uh, Hamas commando from his armed group called Al-Qassam entered inside Israel and was able to infiltrate different villages from Zderot to other small kibbutz around Gaza Strip, and they detained a few, few people from Israel, like around 52 people were taken hostage and brought inside Gaza Strip. There are hundreds of people dead on the Israeli side and uh, hundreds of people dead on Gaza side as well. Benjamin Netanyahu is in contact with American President Joe Biden and a lot of international solidarity is going towards Israel at this moment. But there is a, a very serious statement that has been released by Hezbollah in Lebanon saying that they are in solidarity with Gaza, with the Palestinians that started this attack and say that this attack proved that there is no Arab state that can think about normalized ties with Israel if the Palestinian issue is not solved. 
international correspondent Flavia Capellini reporting for us from Jerusalem. And joining us now to discuss further is Uriel Efstein, Chief Executive Officer at the Renew Democracy Initiative. Thank you for being with us to discuss. This unprecedented attack comes practically 50 years to the day of the 1973 Mideast War when Syria and Egypt attacked on Yom Kippur. Were there any signs of provocation in the last weeks or days that could have suggested this attack would be carried out or was imminent? Thank you for having me on. Um, the honest truth is we don't know yet. Um, you are going to have in the coming days, weeks, and months a huge number of recriminations and questions within Israel as to how this attack could have gone unnoticed. The level of complexity and the sophistication of this attack is unprecedented. And the fact that Israel, with one of the world's most sophisticated intelligence agencies, was unable to see this coming is is a catastrophe. I mean, in, in Israeli uh, terms, this is to the Yom Kippur War of 1973, where Israel was caught by surprise. In American terms, this is 9-11. In fact, proportionally, more Israelis will have died as a result of this attack, ultimately, uh, than Americans uh, on 9-11. And it, by today's standards, a lot of the images and videos that we're seeing coming out of Israeli settlements, villages, and communities remind me of Bucha and Erpin in Ukraine in the early days of the war. I mean, you see militants in uh, vehicles randomly at civilians, killing them at, you know, again, just haphazardly as they will, taking people hostage. I mean, this is just truly, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to understate uh, the horror of what's been going on on the ground. Yeah, we've seen videos of buildings collapsing, uh, cars on fire. It's just total chaos and destruction there. The White House in a statement has condemned today's attack, saying the U.S. stands ready to offer support. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia, which has been in talks with the U.S. about normalizing relations with Israel, just released a statement calling for restraint. Uh, seeing as how President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu's relationship has been tested this year and, and many say is strained, do you see the U.S. responding any further? Uh, yes, I, I think regardless of the interpersonal relationship between the Israeli Prime Minister and the American President, there is absolutely no question that the United States will continue to support Israel uh, because, quite frankly, it's in uh, the America's interest to do so. Right. In addition to the fact that Israel is a core ally, this is not merely a localized conflict. Right. So Hamas clearly wanted to disrupt a potential Israeli Saudi deal. But that's not where this ends. Iran is Hamas's biggest backer. Right. They supported them with weapons, funding, training. And just in June, uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad were in Tehran. And meanwhile, Russia's hand, and this is also significant, right? Uh, Hamas has learned uh, from Russian tactics in Ukraine, and Putin was in Tehran just last year, and they became clear partners. And Russia's goal in all of this is, of course, to distract from Ukraine and to force Western powers to consider withholding armaments in order to uh, move the focus to some extent back to the Middle East. So again, from the American point of view, uh, a you know a resounding Israeli victory and maintaining Israeli defense is absolutely critical in order to protect uh, the interests of the free world. And historically, we've seen smaller attacks, but never anything of this magnitude and coordination. How far does this push back a possible resolution? Is there any likely outcome to even come to a ceasefire that satisfies or, or can calm both sides at this point? No. No, there is not. Uh, remember back in 2011, uh, what Israel uh, was, what Israel did in order to return a single Israeli who had been kidnapped by Hamas. Right now, as we heard from your international correspondent, there are at least 52. Uh, my estimate is actually that that number is much higher, not to mention the hundreds of Israelis who have been killed. So the very tragic truth is that this campaign will last weeks, uh, if not months, um, and it's going to result most likely in, in an incursion into Gaza, uh, where Israel will have no choice uh, but to try to take out the Hamas leadership and try to do whatever it can to return its hostages safely. So again, tragically, this is just the beginning of, uh, you know, what will be an incredibly uh, horrifying conflict.
Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to uh, another edition of the Remnant Report. I am your host, the Remnant Warrior, and back with me today, I have got uh, my brother in Christ and special guest all the way from South Africa. Brother, how are you doing today? My brother, fine and you. Doing good. Before we started recording, we were talking about, um, well, we were talking about a lot of things, but we were just going over the the short little uh, documentary type uh, recording I made the other day on uh, Alistair Crowley's um, Bolster house on Loch Ness. And uh, if you want, we can uh, pick up, you know, right where we left off because you were saying that he's one of the most obscure individuals in, you know, the past 200 years, at least, uh, maybe not 200 years, but at least the past 100 years in the occult world. But I actually found something out this past week that I never knew before, and uh, that is that Crowley did not create, like, the whole the Lima, the religion of the Lima, and do what thou wilt. He didn't create that. He stole that. I can't remember the book that he stole it from, but it was, it, it was, uh, every bit of it was invented like a hundred years before and he just plagiarized it completely um in part two that that thing on the bolster house was just part one but in part two i'm actually going to cover his occult history you know um beginning with the golden dome and um freemasonry and then yeah the lima his uh supposed religion that he created but he actually didn't create it and i'm gonna i'm gonna cover all of that but you're right he is extremely obscure and there are a lot of things we know about him but then there are other things that we don't know yeah yeah um you know the the thing that's interesting to me about about alistair crowley is one of the rituals that he did was the Babylon working. And mm -hmm. what's interesting to me is that you, you, you should help me if I'm wrong now, but I think it was in 1947 that they did the ritual. And as far as I know, it's one of the most dangerous satanic rituals that, that you can possibly do. And the interesting thing is that they did this ritual, and right after that, you had the whole Roswell incident and more and more UFO sightings and this type of stuff. And what's interesting to me is that there seems to be a connection between UFO sightings, UFO abductions, the whole UFO phenomenon. There seems to be a connection between that and what Alistair Crowley did, and then there comes a third part in which is the there's something about the UFO phenomenon that's connected to the Nephilim. So it seems yes. to me. And I think that goes back to the fact that the Nephilim, when they die, the Book of First Enoch tells us that their spirits became what the New Testament calls demons and yeah. the Old Testament called the Shadim, which are still, you know, the demons, the disembodied spirits of the dead Nephilim. And there is a huge connection between the demonic realm and UFO phenomenon. Now, I don't believe that all aliens are demons because demons don't have a body. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I think that the government quite possibly could have 
use some sort of fallen alien technology to create bodies for them. I mean, if if Jesus cast Legion out into the body of the pigs, we know that demons can inhabit bodies. So, you know, the government could just grow brain dead bodies, you know, with yeah. their their cloning technology. So that's possible, but I think some of them are actual fallen aliens. I mean, are fallen angels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see in the Bible, the canonized scriptures in the book of Ezekiel, we see the Ophanum. Now the Ophanum in both extra biblical Jewish text and Jewish lore as well as canonized literature are both actual beings like angels, some yeah. form of, you know, some form of created being, angelic being, but they're they're also um it's also a word that we see used for a vehicle that angels travel in, a UFO. You know, it's, it, it translates to wheel, a wheel within a wheel, or some some translations just say wheels, but most say a wheel within a wheel. And you know, you get a picture of, uh like the wheel spinning, the, the two wheels that are connected, one inside the other, I forget what they're called, but, you know, you'll see them spinning sometimes on a table or whatever. Um, that's the image I get in my head, and it could very easily be what we see as the, you know, the spinning disc, the UFO craft. But yeah. in nowhere in the canon of scripture or even books like first Enoch do we see angels you know the sons of God be they archangels or you know uh, the cherub or the seraphim um, none of them are these chubby little baby thing looking things with wings or these mighty looking warriors with two wings you know they aren't mm -hmm. flying around with wings the only thing that we see with wings doesn't ever talk about them flying with wings like as far as two wings you know they have the wings that are covering all around them i can't remember if it's the cherubim or the seraphim in ezekiel um, and also in the revelation I mean, in Revelation, I think, but their wings have eyes, you know, all over them. And they seem to be for a different purpose besides traveling. Um, the The only thing that you truly see traveling in the air is like the cloud and the pillar of fire, you know, the 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 cloud by day that went before the Israelites and then the pillar of fire that went before them by night and then the Ophanum, the, the wheels within wheels, which I think is, is just a, you know, another term for a vehicle. Um, the ancient alien crowd loves to jump on that and say that it's proof that angels are aliens and that they're spaceships, but it's not. Um, the only way that the sons of God, that angels could be considered aliens is uh, in the fact that they are, you know, they're not terrestrial. They are from outside of the earth. They're yeah. from the heavens. But I think we're going to see a resurgence of the Nephilim and the Watchers the deeper into the end times and especially the tribulation that we get. Um, 
Revelation 9, like you and I were talking about, uh, and really all through Revelation, we see angels fallen in Revelation 12. We see a third of the angels, which in my opinion, Revelation 12 happened in the first century. Um, Revelation is a book that is telling a story. It's a narrative. And it, it, it's not one um, long narrative. It, it repeats. You know, you, mm-hmm. you'll, you, you see starting in Revelation 1 through 3, we're in the first century and when revelation chapter six starts or you you could even argue revelation chapter four you're back in the first century but definitely chapter six and then when you get to revelation 12 it starts over and it tells the same narrative from a different angle, a different viewpoint, um, you know, I, I, it it's kind of what makes Revelation so hard for us to get the complete picture. You know, no matter how much we study it, no matter how many years, I can't tell you how many times. Um, my view of the end times has changed in some way, even if it's a small way. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I'll study scripture and I'll see something, the Lord, Holy Spirit will reveal something to me from the word of God that I never saw before, even though I had read the same passage over and over. And that's just the way that God reveals things to us. And I think it's, a good thing i think it keeps us on our toes it keeps us able to study scripture no matter how long we've been you know in the body of christ it makes it's literally the way that god talks to us you know we we talk to god through prayer and then he talks back through his word and that's yeah. why prayer and the word of god are supposed to go hand in hand exactly yeah and that's why that's why we need to we need to read the bible prayerfully um i mean you know to to read something and then to pray about it and uh doing cross-referencing and seeing how the New Testament and Old Testament go together. Um, I, I think I mentioned this before when when we spoke in another interview. Um, you know what's what's shocking in South Africa where I live is that you hear so many churches say things like, "Yes, well, the the Old Testament is just history, and we only need to focus on the New Testament, and the Old Testament is not important." And then people, when I refer to the Old Testament, the only thing they think of is, well, it's it's a bunch of old rules and laws and so on. But it it shows you how little they know, and they don't understand the 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 fact that the Bible is one book, Old and New Testament. It's one book. I mean, you can't absolutely you can't say, okay, let's throw the Old Testament out. I mean. If you look at <clears throat> the book of Revelation, um, I mean, if you don't if you don't uh, read Isaiah and you don't read Ezekiel and Jeremiah and all the other prophets, Especially Daniel, yeah, and and Daniel, if if you don't read them, how on earth are you going to understand what Revelation is talking about? Because Revelation yeah. is kind of like a a nexus where everything comes comes together, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. The, the vision was given to Daniel and Daniel was told to seal up the vision, to to close the book. But 
the vision is not sealed in Revelation. John's not told to to close, but just a portion of it. He, yeah. There's only a portion of it that he's told not to write down. Um, you know, without the Old Testament, how are you possibly going to know why Jesus died? Why, what the gospel is? How could you know the gospel message without knowing that first God created the world and man perfect, sinless, yeah. And then because of the serpent in the garden uh, tricking Eve and Adam and Eve eating the fruit, disobeying God from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, sin came into the world and death came into the world. And yeah. man and God were separated. It, it put a separation between mankind and God and mankind became broken and, and all throughout history from then on and you see it all through the Old Testament man has tried to fill that brokenness with everything he can be it false gods or uh, drugs alcohol work uh, sex um, relationships all kind of worldly things and nothing in this world is going to fill a God-sized hole that mankind has inside of him yeah. so what God did was he sent Jesus because Jesus was literally God in flesh in flesh human form and he lived a perfect life he kept the old testament law which we would know nothing about without the old testament he fulfilled it by keeping it perfectly and then died on the cross as the only perfect sacrifice so that if we and then he rose from the dead of course and if we will just believe on him and follow him, then we can be reconciled back to God and eventually in the resurrection, we will be made perfect like we were in the beginning, like it was when God first created the world and mankind. And that sin that we all have, the sin nature that we all have that separates us from God, every one of us knows right from wrong and we know what we should do and what we shouldn't do. But without the Bible, the Old Testament, in fact, we have no idea why it's wrong. And we have yeah. no idea that when we die, because the Bible's clear, it's appointed unto every man and woman wants to die and then the judgment. So when we die without the Bible, Old Testament and New, we have no way of knowing that we need Jesus to reconcile us back to the Father. And exactly. it's the very reason why the Old Testament is absolutely essential to the message of the gospel. You know, um, you, you can't have the New Testament without the Old. Um, and like you said, it's one book you have, you literally from beginning in Genesis chapter one, when God creates the heaven and the earth, you have Jesus from Genesis to revelation. It's Jesus from cover to cover. You just have to know 
how to look and what to look for. And, you know, once you become a believer and start studying the word of God, eventually you'll be able to see that. Yeah, and exactly. Um, it's important. You know, the, the thing is, it's, it's shocking to hear how many pastors and ministers and so on all over the world um, have this kind of thing where they say, well, they they believe in evolution. Now, if you if you look carefully at it, you know it's as if it's it's part of the whole thing of throwing out the Old Testament because um, they fall for the lie of evolution. Of you know, they they think okay, creation is creation is something that's impossible. Uh, creation is something that's uh, ludicrous, but. I mean, what's more ludicrous, believing in intelligent design or believing in a bunch of bacteria transforming into monkeys and then monkeys becoming humans? I mean, uh, intelligent design sounds, despite the fact that I know intelligent design is, that's the truth. Uh, it, it just also, it sounds much more, much more plausible, you know, um, than believing Absolutely. in a bunch of bacteria bunch of bacteria transforming into monkeys and then monkeys becoming humans and I mean what they do is they now throw out the Genesis account of creation eventually they throw out the whole Old Testament and now the thing is if you don't understand the whole concept of the Garden of Eden before the fall of man then you will not understand what Jesus says and what the Apostle says when they talk about um, the second coming and man being uh, returned to a state of where we live in perfect peace uh, in, in paradise and where we live in perfect peace with Jesus in the new Jerusalem. I mean, the new Jerusalem is actually, um, you said it earlier, it's, it's kind of like a reflection of the Garden of Eden before the fall. So what these people are doing is they, they are tampering with not just the Bible, but they're tampering with the whole account and <clears throat> the whole uh, linear circular connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, especially regarding prophecy. And <clears throat> the thing is, if you, um, that's why we, we hear so, you, you go and sit in 99.9% .9 of churches in South Africa or the US or wherever, you won't hear a, a sermon on revelation. You won't hear a sermon on spiritual warfare because they don't, they, have, they don't have the faintest idea what spiritual warfare is. You go deeper, um, you'll never hear them talking about people um, talking about, well, you know, I've, I've had a strange um, experience where I've been abducted it feels like it was a nightmare, but I know it really happened to me. I was abducted by beings, and I, I can't make sense of what on earth it is that, that happened. And someone tell, told me to call out the name of Jesus Christ, and I did, and they disappeared instantly. Um, if you don't understand the whole account of the fall of man, the corruption of the daughters of man, um, uh, fallen angels, the watchers having relationships with the daughters of men and the Nephilim being born. And you don't understand the whole account of <clears throat> the Tower of Babel. Then um, there's a lot of things that you're not going to, going to understand. And that's why we see this whole thing all over the world of the prosperity gospel, which obviously is a total heresy where they just, you know, they read from the New Testament and then they take things out of context and say, Oh, well, Jesus wants you to be a millionaire. And he wants you to have, I don't know, five vacation houses overseas. And everything is about making money, you know, um, which is a total, total perversion of the gospel. It absolutely is. I was listening to you, but I was also, uh, I was looking through Isaiah here. You and I were, were talking hmm. Um, about same thing we're talking about now, how the Old Testament is 
critical to the understanding of the end times in so many yeah. places and Isaiah, especially in the Septuagint and anyone who's followed the remnant report for uh, yeah, any length of time, you know, any, uh, any considerable length of time knows that I am Anabaptist and I am all for living the way the first century, second century, third century church, early third century church lived. Um, mm -hmm. Well, third century, the, the, the first, second, and third century. Um, but when you get into the fourth century, the 300s, um, that's when the uh, Council of Nicaea happened in I think 325, something like that. Um, and so, but the anti-Nicene period, the pre-Nicene early church, and yeah. going all the way back to before the time of Jesus to the entire New Testament period, you know, all the, the teachings of Jesus, the apostles, and the anti-Nicene church, the church all the way up until the 400s when Jerome, under the direction of the Catholic Pope, was charged with making a new uh, translation or uh, transliteration is a more accurate term of scripture and it was supposed to be based on the Septuagint although he defied the uh, false bishop of, of Rome you know the Pope um, it was actually mm -hmm. I think the first Pope uh, but in any case the reason it was supposed to be based on the Septuagint is because the entire anti-Nicene period going all the way back through the New Testament period and even before the New Testament period into the Old Testament period. It actually, you see it in the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is the last book in our canon of scripture that any part of it was written in original ancient Hebrew. Yeah. When, when the uh, nation, the kingdom of Judah, was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon, um, during those years they were there, they lost their language. And they started speaking the, the language of the Chaldeans, which was essentially... Um, it, well, it was the Assyrian language. It wasn't just the language of the Babylonians. It was the language of a lot of people, the Assyrians, uh, the Babylonians. Um, and it was, you'll hear a lot of people, especially in um, academic circles, scholarly circles, some of them claim that the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew, uh, but when they say Hebrew, they're actually talking about Aramaic. You'll hear a lot of people in those same circles claim that Jesus, um, his natural tongue, w was Aramaic. The reason for that is Aramaic is essentially the the language of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, you know, the Assyrians, the language of the worshipers of the moon god. Every bit of the Y names for God, I, whether it's Yahweh, uh, Yehovah. Yahoshua, Yah, uh, Yeshua, Yah, all, all of the Y names come from the Assyrian script. It is 
the same thing that the modern Hebrews speak today. If you went to the Hebrew Institute of Jerusalem mm. to learn Hebrew, the first thing you would find out, the first thing that the students, you know, we're talking Israeli citizens, the first thing they find out, like, in America, in public schools, the kids are taught English because it's our native language. Now, yeah. once you get into high school or junior high, middle school, and then high school, you learn a second language, and there are many to choose from. But first, you're taught how to write and speak the native language correctly, which is English. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, in Israel, they teach Hebrew, but it's not the Hebrew that Moses spoke or David spoke. It's not even the Hebrew that Daniel spoke originally. And this is very clearly seen. I mean, even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll, there's a copy of the book of Daniel in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I want to say, if I forgive me if I'm mistaken, but I want to say it's the oldest copy in existence that anybody knows about. Half of the book is written in ancient, what's called Paleo Hebrew. And then the rest of the book is written in the Assyrian script. And that's where your your Y names come from. And I don't want to get off topic. I don't want to get on a soapbox. But those Y names were not made popular until the Masoretes, which we're talking Middle Ages, the Masoretes, the Masoretic text, which is what the King James Bible was translated from. Yeah. It's not a it's not a, 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 a Hebrew translation of the Old Testament that dates back to Old Testament times or even New Testament times. You know, the Masoretes who created the Masoretic script, which is used in modern Hebrew today, they didn't complete the, and, and and for those who don't know what Masoretic is, they put the the vowel points on the proto Masoretic. There were uh, quote unquote Hebrew copies of the Old Testament during the first century and on, but they weren't original Hebrew you know they were the language that the uh, that the Babylonians spoke it was the Assyrian script and the Masoretes took that language and they put the vowel points on the letters they they essentially created the vowel system and It doesn't corrupt the Bible if you have a, a King James Bible like I use sometimes um, that's been translated from the Masoretic text. You can get the prophecies for the most part in the Masoretic that's been translated into English the same way you can from the Septuagint that's been translated into English. Yeah. But <clears throat> not exactly the same way. The, the whole reason that the late first, early second century 
Jew, Jewish religious leaders created a new uh, proto-Masoretic, a new translation of scripture was because the Christians were using the prophecies, the clear prophecies from the Septuagint to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. And they were having, I mean, the Bible tells us, the book of Acts tells us they turned the world upside down. They were mm -hmm. having people convert and follow Christ every day, many of them Jews, Jews and Gentiles. And once they entered into the body of Christ, they were a part of the Israel of God. And Jesus, when he quoted the Old Testament, like he did many times, and when the apostles quoted the Old Testament, they were quoting the Septuagint. Yeah. And all you have to do to find that out is go in your Bible, find one of the places Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, then flip back to that passage and see if it says what Jesus said. And you're going to find every time that it doesn't. Yeah. But if you go to that same Old Testament scripture in the Septuagint, it's going to read word for word. And that's because Jesus used the Greek Septuagint. That was the early Jewish Bible. It was the early Christian Bible. And it's the reason why I use the Septuagint for the most part today. Um, you know, I don't always use it, but when I'm studying scripture, especially if I'm doing some kind of intense study, I always use my Branton's uh, Septuagint in modern English. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I'm so thankful that I was introduced to it. And I know I said a mouthful there, a lot more than I intended to say, but I said all that to talk about the passage in Isaiah that we were talking about, um, because yeah. it doesn't say the same thing in, you know, like I've got King James in front of me. It doesn't say the same thing. And this, the King James is translated from the Masoretic, the quote unquote Hebrew. Um, yeah. As the Septuagint says, the Septuagint gives a prophecy of in the end times. God says that giants or Nephilim are coming to fulfill his wrath. Yeah. And when we look in Revelation chapter 9 and we see that uh, Apollyon, uh, Abaddon, the angel of the bottomless pit well, is going to be given the keys to the bottomless pit and he's the king over these demon fallen angel hybrid entities that all rise up out of the abyss um, mm -hmm. I think we are seeing a clear image of that prophecy that was given in Isaiah and, you know, because they're not going to be attacking Christians. Those who have the seal of the living God in their forehead, they're commanded not to hurt. It's yeah. only, and they're commanded not to hurt the earth. Only those who don't have the seal of the living God in their forehead. You know, um, it's, as you were saying earlier when we were talking um Jesus said that men's hearts will fail them. And, and the translation there doesn't really do it justice. What the Greek says there is what we would know in English as a heart attack. Men are going to be having heart attacks for the things they see coming upon the earth. Up onto the earth, it says. 
So they're going to be coming up out of the earth. Yeah. And it's going to cause people's hearts to fail them. Now, I don't think they're really going to have heart attacks, but that's what is implicated there. And the reason I don't think they're really going to have heart attacks, or even if they do have heart attacks, it's not going to matter, because we're told in Revelation that in those days, men will seek death, but death will flee from them. And yeah. <clears throat> those days are talking about the days when the the hordes of demons and fallen angels have come up out of the abyss and are are torturing men and women anyone who has the mark of the beast yeah, exactly and you know um what coming back to what we also said about people who throw out who claim that you can throw out the old testament you listen to people who come out of satanic cults and to get born again and so on and they testify about what they've heard and what they've seen while they were in the cult they will tell you stuff like the elite satanic cults have a massive obsession with Nimrod and uh -huh. along with that they have a massive obsession with Apollyon or Abaddon as we read who we read about in Revelation 9 and they a lot of them talk about a, a modern day breeding program uh, which relates to once again it there's there's a, something a, regarding the alien abduction phenomenon related to that and also the nephilim because they they um, hint at a kind of a modern day breeding program that people that certain governments or maybe all the governments all over the world are involved in but but the problem is if you're a pastor in a church now you claim okay well anyone in my church can come to me and talk to me and get counsel or whatever and now you say well we only read the new testament now someone comes to you and says well um i i need help you know i was involved in a satanic cult and um I we had obs an obsession with Nimrod. If you don't know your Old Testament, you're not going to know who Nimrod is. Uh, many people think that Nimrod is only spoken of in uh, Genesis 10 and um, he's mentioned briefly elsewhere. But if you read the prophet Isaiah very carefully, you'll see that in Isaiah many times um, the text alludes to uh, the Assyrian. God talks to Isaiah about the Assyrian and he talks about, I know in the King James, he talks about Asher. Now, Asher is Assyria. And when he talks about the Assyrian, he's alluding, he's alluding to. Um, is, it, is it Isaiah or Ezekiel that talks about the Assyrian? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm asking. I think it, I'm not sure now myself. I think it might be. I know they're yeah. both. Uh, talking very yeah. closely about the same thing and i get yeah. because isaiah is the passage that talks about uh lucifer you know it has the the prophecy uh, or not prophecy but um the yeah. description of the fall of lucifer um and it uses the king of tyre um i always get that confused with uh the prophecy in um, Ezekiel. I can't ever remember which one is talking about the king of Tyre and which one is the Assyrian. Um, I, I just always, I have to go and look. It's just one of those things that I get confused. I always have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, the, the thing is now, if, if you're a pastor and you well, you don't have any knowledge about the Old Testament. You claim, well, we can throw it out. You won't follow the old narrative of, of someone who's coming to you for counseling and telling you, listen, I've been traumatized. I've been involved in this cult and I, I got out and I, I need help, you know. And um, they tell you all about this stuff. But if you know 
uh, right from the start, what Genesis is talking about and what the prophets are talking about and what Jesus is saying and what eventually what the, the book of Revelation tells us, then you know, well, um, these people involved in cults are brainwashed into believing um, that Satan basically defeated Jesus at Calvary. They take what the Bible says and they switch it completely around. Okay. And you understand the whole thing of, if you understand the Old Testament, you understand the whole thing of where the, the Nephilim comes in and you understand the whole thing of what Revelation is telling us. Because Revelation says in Revelation 12 verse 12 that the devil is angry because he knows his time is short. Time is so short. That's, why, yeah, that's why he's desperately trying to brainwash people into believing the exact exact opposite of what the Bible says and um, you know just throwing them into a whole world of confusion and chaos and getting them to believe that well there's no hope and sadly that's the thing also we see in the entertainment industry for example you you had the, um, the that horrible horror movie that's like a classic uh the exorcist that came out in what was it 1972 i think 70 70 something yeah it was before i was born but yeah yeah and now i see they've made like a, some sort of a sequel or a prequel uh the name is yeah, they've exorcist made... believer or something like that mm -hmm. they've made quite a few of them one this year uh, they didn't make it this year but it came out it's called the pope's exorcist based on a true story. Yeah. Um, I, I did watch that one. I'm, I wanted to see, you know, how they were going to show exorcism being done. And of course, it was a Catholic priest. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually thought they did a pretty good job showing just how little power there is in anyone trying to cast out a demon who you know isn't filled with the holy spirit um because no. that demon of course they uh use the same nonsense that the modern demon slayers and the catholic church still believe that you have to know the name of the demon in order to be able to cast it out it's nonsense you never saw jesus um conversing with demons any more than he had to he didn't call them by name the only time um we see that at all is with legion and it didn't get any more specific than legion for we are many um the specific name of the demons were never given the apostles never ask the name of a demon when they cast them out and they never casted the demons out of christians and the only time that we see a non-believer try to cast out a demon it was with the sons of sceva and you know, those demons put a beating on them boys because, uh, you know, they said, Paul, we know, Jesus, we know, but who are you? Um, and they showed that they had no authority even using the name of Jesus. Exactly. But, yes. um, going back to Isaiah and end times prophecy in Isaiah 13, you see a beautiful parallel between Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation. We were talking earlier about um, Jesus saying that men's hearts would fail them for the things that are coming up upon the earth. And we were talking about Revelation 9 and the horrible things that are coming up out of the earth. Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the, you know, the sun being darkened moon turning to blood stars falling to the sky before the great and terrible day of the lord um jesus says that men will cry out for the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the wrath of the lamb what we see in isaiah 13 and 
this is also what I was saying earlier about how using something like the King James that was translated from the Masoretic, it's still the word of God. You know, God has preserved his word. You can still get what the Bible is trying to say, yeah. especially with the New Testament. The New Testament, there's no difference because they use the Greek, you know, the original Greek, the the uh, majority text. But in Isaiah 13, we see here, um, Isaiah is talking about the burden of Babylon that he saw. And this is a, a prophecy of the end times. Um, we know it's the end times because of the things that are talked about here. It's talking about the day of the Lord. And there are only two events that the Bible calls the day of the Lord. And that is the, the first advent of Christ and the second advent of Christ. So at yeah. the very least, it's talking about uh, the crucifixion um, and, you know, that time, the, the first century A.D. And most likely, it's talking about the time we're living in right now and very soon to come. But it says, lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain." exalt the voice unto them shake the hand that may go into the gates of the nobles i have commanded my it says here this we were talking about the differences it says i have commanded my sanctified ones and i have also called my mighty ones for mine anger now this is based on the masoretic so it doesn't say what the septuagint says but in the Septuagint, in my Brenton's Modern English, it tells you what it says. Um, that, that, that word mighty ones there is translated from the Hebrew gibberim. Yeah. Um, and that's another word along with rephaim, which means gibbering means mighty ones um rephaim means dead ones nephilim means fallen ones um zamzumim means buzzing ones uh but all of these nephilim tribes or all of these tribes that are named in the Old Testament that God commands the Israelites to wipe out in the promised land. They're, they're all named after the Nephilim, the giants. They're, all of these words that these tribes are named after, you can remove that name and insert the word giant. So when we see here, when Isaiah 13 says in verse three i have commanded my sanctified ones and i have also called my mighty ones another way and this is what the septuagint says my giants for my anger even them that rejoice in my highness the noise of a multitude in the mountains like as of a great people. It is a tumultuous noise of the kingdom of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord, and they are the weapons of his indignation. They have come to destroy the whole land. Cry ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. 
and they shall all be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them as a as the pang of a woman that travaileth in birth. So here we see this is the same thing. This this is what Jesus was going back to in Matthew 24. Yeah. And it says they shall be amazed at another, at one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the entire world for its evil and the wicked for their sins. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. This is the part that I like, and I actually pointed this out in an episode I did a while back on Revelation 9 and the return of Apollo and the Watchers. It says here in verse 12, the Lord says to Isaiah the prophet, he says, I will make a man more precious than fine gold. Even a man, he will be more precious than the wedge of Ophir. So in other words, so many people are going to be destroyed that you know, you'll be more likely to find gold in the ground under your feet as to find a living man because God's going to make men more precious than gold. They're going to be that scarce. And it, it shows that when Jesus said that the way is narrow and there will be few who find it, no. that goes double for the tribulation, the end times, you know, the whole world, except for the remnant of the Israel of God, the saints that, that the beast is making war with, except for the saints of God, the entire world will be openly worshiping Satan through their worship of the beast and the dragon who gives the beast his power. And it's why it is so important that everyone who is not a Christian, everyone who, whether you went to church all your life or you've never stepped foot in church before and didn't even know you needed Jesus. You've never even heard of Jesus. Either way, we've told you today, even though it was a short explanation, that in the beginning God created us all perfect without sin, but then through our disobedience, sin entered the world. And because of that sin, we not only were separated from God, but we all, every single one of us, have to die. And after death comes judgment. Even though hell was not made for mankind, mankind was going to hell after sin and death entered into the world. And I'm not talking about Hades or the grave. I mean at the end, the judgment, the lake of fire. Mankind was destined for the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. And that is why Jesus put on more, a mortal body. And died as a sacrifice for our sins. So that if we would just repent of our sins. 
and choose to follow him and believe that he is the son of God and that he is God and that he did die on the cross and that he was rose from the dead three days later, then on the day of judgment, we will not have to go to the lake of fire. Yes, unless we are among the select few who remain until the Lord's second coming, we will have to die. We will have to taste death and, and go to the grave, Hades, Sheol. But if we are followers of Christ, when we die, we'll go to paradise. And our spirits will until the resurrection when we'll be given a new body that's like the body of Jesus Christ when he rose from the dead. So I urge everyone that can hear the sound of my voice, regardless when you're watching this, seek the Lord while he can still be found. Because there's coming a day soon and very soon for all of us, you know, end times aside, we're all going to die. And on the scheme of things, even if you live 80 more years, that's not long. So seek the Lord while you can. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow. You don't know if you'll be alive in an hour. Yeah. Don't put off for tomorrow what you can do today. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, Jeremy, the the thing is, um, just today, um, my wife and I drove past a certain church near our house, and um, I, I know for a fact that this church, a lot of people have left that church because it's um, they they consider a guy like. Uh, Rick Warren to be a hero. Now, Rick Warren is one of the people that says, well, you don't have to study the book of Revelation and, you know, don't don't really be concerned about end times. And also, we Christians can take hands with mus Muslims and Buddhists. The wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah, the wolf in sheep's clothing, you know. And that's that's the whole thing. What people need to understand is you, you have this whole agenda and um, earlier when we mentioned the movie The Exorcist, the new one that came out, um, I I don't want to watch it, but I've, I've watched the trailer on YouTube and something that really made me sad, but also made me laugh at the same time, was in the trailer, the one character when she, apparently when she um, realizes that this girl is demon possessed, then she says to another character, well, um, you know, all these religions have a right of exorcism, and what we now need to do to save her is we need to call the Christians and the Hindus and everybody together to each do their right of exorcism so that this girl can be saved. It's the same agenda, you know, this whole thing of, well, all religions are the same, and we worship the same God, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are more than one way to God. While well, Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life, he's the only way to God the Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's what people need to realize. Don't, you know, don't fall for all this agenda, these these dark agendas that you have in, in popular media. Because sadly, a lot of people all over the world, if Hollywood says something or popular media in general says something, then people fall for it. And because they don't read their Bible, they don't know what the Bible actually says. And they believe, well, well, right. it's probably somewhere in the Bible where it says that, oh, it's okay to worship Jesus, but you can also worship Buddha and Muhammad or whoever. So people need to need to wake up and need to realize that there's only one way to God the Father That's and that right. is Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus is the only way. That's right. Yeah. And he said so himself. He said that he is the way. He yeah. is the only way to the Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. 
and mm. you know uh the bible I, I don't care what religious text you put it up against what historical text you put it up against the bible is the only book that has never been disproven it is the only book that has literally you have the book of daniel prophesying things for hundreds and even thousands of years before they happen and they happen exactly like they were prophesied to same with uh isaiah um Isaiah prophesied the way Jesus would his entire ministry, but mm -hmm. it, that people think that the description we all know and hear of the death of Christ and, and his his suffering and death comes from the New Testament. It doesn't. It comes from the prophet Isaiah. It was the exactly. prophet Isaiah that said, by his stripes, we would be healed. And exactly. it is truly amazing to read that prophecy in the Septuagint. I mean, it'll blow your mind. It's mm -hmm. accurate, you know, reading it in the King James. But if you read it in the Septuagint, it's just like, there's nobody else this could possibly be talking about. Jesus is who he said he is, and he died on a cross 2,000 years ago, but my friends, the good news is he didn't stay in the grave. Jesus is alive. Jesus Amen. rose from the dead three days later, was seen by many, many witnesses, broke mm -hmm. bread ate with people and then ascended to the right hand of the father 40 days later where he has ruled and reigned from his throne in the new jerusalem up in heaven where we rule and reign with him uh, the new testament tells us that you know the kingdom came with christ i mean the kingdom of God is at hand is what Jesus said, not Jeremy. I didn't say that. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, yeah. meaning it's now, it's coming now. Um, mm. You know, people often hear me talk about the early church and Anabaptist and really the only biblical perspective on the kingdom of God. And they, they'll think that I am an amillennialist or something like that. Um, and for anyone who doesn't understand what I'm talking about, I urge you, I urge you to just go back in the, the videos in right here on YouTube. And it's like two videos back. You'll see a video about the millennial kingdom it's with brother david Berceau. he explains the original view of the millennium and it is the view that i hold so anyone who thinks that i am amillennial or post-millennial or some other false doctrine that's not what i'm talking about the bible Biblical prophecy, more times than not, is fulfilled in stages. It's something I like to call now but not yet. Um, yeah. And it's where we have a partial fulfillment of prophecy, but it's, it, it's not a complete fulfillment. The kingdom came with Jesus, but and, and when we enter into the kingdom is when we get saved as people call it that's yeah. uh 
coming on to the vine that is Jesus Christ, entering into Israel, you know, whether you were born with Jewish blood or Gentile blood, you must be grafted back onto the olive tree that is the Israel of God. Exactly, yes. The New Testament is clear that they're talking about the flesh, that there is no Jew or Gentile. You know, if you are in Christ Jesus, then you are Abraham's seed and therefore heirs according to the promises God made to Abraham. If yeah. and only if it doesn't say if you're in Jesus or you were born into one of the 12 tribes. That's not what it says. Mm -hmm. It does. It, that we don't have two covenants going simultaneously. Uh, the book of Hebrews tells it as plain as it can. You know, what is old is getting ready to pass away. So the new thing can come in. Uh, the it old covenant is. has passed away. People like to say, they like to misquote Jesus and say, Jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And that the law would not pass away until all things were fulfilled. Jesus also 100% fulfilled the law with his life and death. On the cross, Jesus said it is finished. Yeah. He wasn't talking about my agony is finished. No. What he came to do in his first advent is fulfilling of the old covenant law, the law of Moses was finished and when he rose again he ushered in the kingdom of heaven and the new covenant and it was after he died i mean i could easily prove this if i had the time not going to take the time to do it today but it was after he died and rose again that in the upper room, he breathed on his disciples and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then that's another one of those uh, now, but not yet uh, fulfillment of prophecy. The Holy Ghost was given to the apostles when Jesus breathed on them, but it wasn't until Jesus ascended up into heaven and the day of Pentecost came that they fully were indwelt with the Holy Spirit. You know, that they fully received the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. And furthermore, you know, I think that it shows so much more that I wish I had the time to point out but we're running out of time i want us before we we end we've had a, a really good fruitful conversation we've talked about some important things but i want before we end to talk about your book some and hmm. let everybody know one more time well not that this will be the last time but you know everything about your book where they can find the the ebook and you know what we've got in the works up and coming but um i do want to say this before we jump to the book and that is we are and have been since the first century since jesus um, came into his kingdom, you know, people a, a lot of times misunderstand Matthew 24 and its parallel passages in Mark and Luke. They think that everything Jesus says in the Olivet Discourse is all talking about the tribulation, and it's not. Jesus starts off talking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. 
preterist would like to to tell you and make you believe that all of Matthew 24 and Revelation was talking about things that would happen in the first century and that you know the end times began and ended in the first century but we have to have a balanced view of scripture and we have to exegete the entire word of god and not use our preconceived notions and beliefs to eisegete or read into the scriptures we can't add our interpretations to the scriptures we have to take from out of the scriptures the interpretations that are there i mean and the best interpretation no matter what passage it is is the most literal yeah if it's if it's a symbolic passage then the most literal interpretation would be symbolically um, if it's a literal passage, then the most literal interpretation is a literal one. Um, and that's, that's the way that you interpret the word of God. And you also allow the Bible to interpret the Bible. And you use the teachings, the red letters of Jesus Christ to interpret everything else all of the other epistles that paul wrote peter wrote jude wrote john wrote you interpret what they said james wrote you interpret what they said through what jesus said and what he taught not the other way around that's how false doctrine is created by right? exactly. people cherry picking verses to make doctrine or trying to interpret Jesus through Paul or you know someone else or trying to do what the Judaizers did but the last thing I'm going to say because I know I've been a mic hog today and I apologize for that no problem. <laughs> the last thing I want to say is just that Jesus died for every one of you listening or watching. He, even though you weren't going to be born for 2,000 years, we're talking about the God who created the entire universe and everything in it. He knew you before he created this world. Before you were ever conceived in your mother's womb, he knew you. And he loved you enough to die for you. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners and enemies of God, Christ died for us. Amen. That is a love that we can only try to comprehend. Mm. But it's a love that we should not take for granted. I've said it once already, but I'm going to end and turn it over to you saying it again. Friends, seek the Lord while he may be found. Yeah, um, you know, there's, I think of the, I'm thinking of the verse in Isaiah, it's uh, not Isaiah, sorry, uh, in Hebrews. In Hebrews, I think it's at the, the very last verse of Hebrews 12, where it says, our God is a consuming fire. And you know, the Lord said that when he 
when he's going to bring judgment again, it's not going to be he's not going to have a global flood again, but he's right. going to send he's going to send fire and brimstone and what people need to understand is if you look at what's going on all over the world now, all over the world there are fires breaking out in countries here in South Africa too. Um, farmers have lost countless uh, amount of cattle and so on. All over the world there are fires. And if you think that is bad, that is just like a little glimpse of what is coming. And the fact of the matter is, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's, uh, you know, there's nothing, there's no one else or nothing else that can save you except Jesus Christ. The, That's right. The day of the Lord will be a day of righteous judgment. And I know the, the usual internet troll atheists are always like, but how can a loving God send people to hell? What they don't understand is God has a perfect sense of everything. I mean, he's the creator I've, of everything. Uh, I've said um, it over and over again, and I, yeah. I, I promise not to interrupt you again, but God doesn't send anyone to hell. Mm -hmm. God will not be sending anybody to hell, even though he'll say, Jesus will say, depart from me, ye workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. It's not uh, a lack of love or even the words of him rejecting those who decided not to accept him. That it's not him sending people to hell. We humans are responsible for going to hell. If yeah. We reject Christ. I mean, Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. And everyone in the world has an ability to be a part of the bride. But Jesus isn't going to make anybody spend eternity with him. A loving God wouldn't. I mean, would it be loving if I enslaved my wife and forced her to stay with me for her entire life no that's not love mm -hmm. love is her wanting to be my wife and it's the same i mean the relationship between christ and the church is a marriage and jesus is the perfect picture of a loving husband he's not going to force anyone to spend eternity with him Exactly. If you look at the the book, um, the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament, it's a book that a lot of people don't talk about. But the Song of Solomon is is actually like a, it's almost like an allegory of Christ as the as the bridegroom and the church as his bride. And at one point he says, and I know there's some of the prophetic books in which he also says the same thing more or less. He says that. He's the bridegroom that went out into the desert and he found his bride in the desert and he brought her and he, he brought her to safety and he cared for her and he's still caring for us. And, you know, if, if you, the, the ancient Hebrews, um, if you go into their history and symbolism and so on, they actually said that the desert is a physical place, but it's also symbolic of the, the dwelling place of devils and unclean spirits and so on. So, you know, if you don't know Jesus Christ and you don't have a relationship with him as your Lord and Savior, it's as if you are a person lost in a desert and you're surrounded by unclean spirits and there's nothing romantic about unclean spirits and about the forces of darkness. They want to That's destroy right. you. End of story. They... They don't feel anything for you. But Jesus is the one who, when you call on him, he will come and take you out of those horrible circumstances and he will lead you to safety and he will care for you as a bridegroom. He is the perfect bridegroom who cares for his bride. He definitely is. And before we have to close this uh, episode, Tell us and tell the people uh, watching, 
because my dogs are starting to bark and I don't want that to be on the <laughs> the video. But okay. let everyone know about your book. Yes, I wrote a book earlier this year. It's called uh, Trauma from a B Biblical Perspective. And it's available as an ebook on, on Amazon. So um, if you go on Amazon uh, and you uh, type in trauma from a biblical perspective, or you um, even on Google, you can type in trauma from a biblical perspective and um, you can add my name to it or just my surname. Um, then you will find it. Uh, it will show us uh, on the results. And it's a, basically a book. It's it's not a long book. It's quite short, and it's about what how we should understand trauma from a biblical perspective. It's basically how we can help people who's suffering from trauma, uh, whether it's you yourself or whether you want to read the book in order to help others. But the point is that. Jesus Christ is the true healer, and he is the only one who can truly heal someone who is so, either suffering from trauma or people suffering from whatever it is, whether it's a disease or whether it's trauma inflicted due to human trafficking, satanic ritual abuse, um, whatever the case might be. And um, the book teaches uh, um, about you know, how we can look at trauma through the Bible and, you know, uh, what the Psalms teach us about God um, as a healer and what, for example, the Gospel according to John teaches us about Jesus healing people and Jesus actually being the perfect host um, who's like, you know, you are, he, he sees you as a guest, as David also wrote in Psalm 23, he says, the Lord prepares a table before me, you know, in the, in the presence of my enemies. And now he is just the, shall I call him like, you know, the perfect gentleman who's always caring for us. And, you know, I mean, Jesus giving his life for us on the cross. And that's the most perfect form of love ever. There's, there's no greater love than that. That's right. So, yeah, the book, the book goes in on trauma and how to deal with it from a biblical perspective and so on. Because in the end, you can go and see as many secular psychologists as you want. You can go to as many psychiatrists as you want. But in the end, it's only Jesus Christ. Who he is the great physician. Yeah. And right now, it's only available on Amazon in ebook form on Kindle, but we are working to get it in paperback, hardcover, and also on, on Audible. And we're going to get it just as fast as we can for you. Because uh, we want to get this message out. It, 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 it is cram packed. It's not a, a long book that's going to take you days to read. You can read it in a day if you try. Um, I mean, it, it, it's full of so much good information and hopefully um, in the, the future, the not too distant future, it can be one of the projects that, that we have where we can expand on it. Um, yeah. Because, you know, one thing I've learned in writing um, when I wrote my first book and then eventually I, I put out the kingdom edition, the second edition is you can always expand on something. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 there was a lot of good information in the original, uh, origins of evil book one, but it's pretty much double the size that it was originally um the, the first edition yeah the first edition the original edition is not even for sale anymore it, it's if you've got an original edition then uh 
you are one of the few because it was only the original was only for sale for a year maybe um and i don't even think it was for sale an entire year because the second edition came out in 2021 and mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure it was less than a year from the time the first edition came out but yeah hopefully we can expand on it but in the meantime we are going to be getting it out in paperback and in hardcover and in audible audiobook for those who like me would rather listen to a book than sit down and read it audible has spoiled me <laughs> i tell you what other than the Bible, I, I don't hardly read anything anymore. I, I just listen to it. Um, uh, the last really good audible book that I listened to that I'm about to recommend, and I, I think I'm even, I am going to put a link to it right underneath the link that I am going to put in the description for your book um i'm going to put the link for the the uh ebook the kindle edition and right underneath that phil baker's new book is an end times book but it it's about a lot of the things we were talking about today how prophecy was originally interpreted end times prophecy in the, the early church the first century church what the mm -hmm. the first christians um thought of when they heard and then later read or um had someone read to them the olivet discourse um or revelation you know, nobody would have heard Revelation unless they were in a, you know, a church service. But Jesus, the Olivet Discourse was a sermon. Jesus gave that sermon. Yeah. So there were people who literally heard Jesus with that. Um, the the disciples heard the, you know, the, the most important parts of it because they came to him privately after what he taught and preached in Matthew 23 and, and they were of course asking him when all these things were going to come to pass and um, in any case Phil Baker's new book um the I'm trying to remember the exact name. Um, I think it's the final abominable temple. It may just be the final temple, but I think it's the final abominable temple. But Phil Baker is the host of Reclaiming the Faith, which is a podcast produced on Omega Frequency and mm. he um, is a part of Omega Frequency and he's an author um, he's been in ministry for many years uh, he ministers in a local church um, he also has an awesome music ministry uh, but he's written at least three books that I know of. Um, I think there's only three. But his third book, I've actually got all three of his books. If he's got more than three, I don't know about anymore. But the three that I do know about, I've got. And the first one was New Wine Skins and the Simple Words of Christ. Um, 
can't remember the name of the second one. My mind just went completely blank thinking about his new one. But he he wrote um, actually it had it wasn't that long ago. That's why I was so surprised when his new one came out over the last few months because it was either the end of last year or the beginning of this year when his second one came out and um then this last one which is about the final temple that's what it's about and he goes through and i don't want to spoil any of it for anybody but trust me when i say forget about any books on the third temple that you've read from I don't care how famous the author is, forget about it. And if you have read it, great. You're going to have the ability to contrast eisegesis and exegesis, what we were talking about earlier, because Phil, Phil's book is the way that you are supposed to interpret scripture especially bible prophecy and it is the best book on the third temple that i've ever read and it in my opinion is his best book yet it's one of the best books i've ever read or listened to if i'm honest but um i i definitely recommend it um And I'm going to be putting the links for both books in the description. Um, Anything you want to say in closing, brother, before we end this episode? No, I just want to thank you, Jeremy, for, um, you know, helping me with the, with the book, uh, you know, the paperback copy and the hard, hard copy and everything. Um, and also thank you thank you a lot for inviting me uh on your podcast i i really i really appreciate it it's, it's always an honor for me oh, to man, speak it, there's uh no thanks necessary my friend it, it is my pleasure 100 percent um you know I, I i i hope i'll be able to get it done faster and this is definitely not the last time you'll be coming on especially once the book is out in paperback hardcover and and audible you know we're gonna set up some some advertisements and hopefully well no not hopefully um i've got some other uh programs that hopefully you'll be willing to go on to talk about it as well Um, yeah but uh we've got coming up i do want to just make a a, an announcement it's october all you guys know what that means if you are in the body of christ it's uh, it is that time of year when those in the occult Satanist witches, they celebrate their high holy day um, mm. <laughs> on October 30th and 31st. And uh, for Halloween this year, we have got an all star lineup program. It's going to be done in a round table setting. I don't know everyone from Kingdom Productions Network that's going to be able to make it yet because um, I'm waiting to hear from John, Jeremy, and Matthew whether or not they're going to be able to make it. But you'll be there, right, brother? Yes, I will. will The two of us will definitely be hosting. And... Our guest, we're gonna. It'll be a, in a roundtable discussion setting. But the guest for this year's program will be Dr. Judd Burton, 
Dr. Aaron Judkins and brother Gary Wayne, along with Curtis and myself, and we're going to be discussing all sorts of things as far as, I mean, we, we've done programs on the origins of Halloween to death, so this year, instead of focusing on its origins, we're going to talk about practices that are still happening today that mm -hmm. those in the occult and in witchcraft and Satanism are doing on their most unholy day of the year night of the year and we're going to be talking about a lot more in terms of Gary Wayne's new book um, we'll be discussing your new book again because they are both um, focused on either the occult itself or um, things that happen because of the occult mm -hmm. and then We've got two incredible minds in Dr. Judd Burton and Dr. Aaron Judkins. Um, I don't know which one is more accurately described as the Christian Indiana Jones Um I know Dr. Judd Burton would say he is for sure, um, but I think that uh, Dr. Aaron Judkins may be giving him a run for his money. In any case, they're both awesome men of God. They are brilliant um, biblical uh, archaeologists, anthropologists. Mm -hmm. They are just full of knowledge and they are going to be coming here on the Remnant Report to share that knowledge with you guys. And that uh, the date of the episode, when it will be airing, I haven't decided yet. Um, in the years past, I've done the episodes on Halloween. So... I don't know, since we're not doing it live this year, I don't know, I mean, I'll, I'll be playing it live, but it won't be recorded live. So I haven't decided if um, I'll wait until Halloween to play it live or not, but it'll be recorded on the October the 14th. So if we get it recorded in time and I can get everything edited and put together then who knows I may play it live that night or the next the next day but I may wait till Halloween and, and air it live we'll see but in any case that's something for you guys to look forward to I know I'm looking forward to it until next time uh, I am the remnant warrior with my brother Tertius and for the Kingdom Productions Network. I just want to say God bless each and every one of you. Until next time, grace and peace.